distance and cover are your friend. If I think somebody truly is a threat, and maybe I'm carrying or maybe I'm not, I'm gonna start looking at my environment. I'm gonna start creating space and still keep as much awareness as possible. The information in this podcast is for entertainment and educational purposes. Our informational content cannot address all dangerous situations and cannot guarantee your survival or prevent injuries when the unexpected happens. The decision to carry a firearm, either for recreation or for personal defense, carries the risk and potential for injury and or death. Therefore, it is advised that you seek out and acquire proper training before using a firearm or any firearm related product. What are some self-defense techniques? What would happen if there was a global internet outage? What should I do if I hear shots ringing out? Or what I should do if there's a major terrorist attack? What should I have? What's the best? What, should I do? what does that look like? What would you recommend? Is there anything I could do? All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Dangerous Questions in the Ironclad Original. Today's dangerous questions are gonna be focused a lot on firearms, manipulation. There's a couple other tactical scenarios in there as well. And again, I think a lot of people have been, been getting great feedback out of how do I carry, what type of gear do I use? You know, we're gonna break all this stuff down and, and we wanna hear from you guys, especially when it comes to situations like this. These are real questions and everyday scenarios that we find ourselves in and we just want to build clarity around it get a little bit of a contrast between you know somebody like myself that's been training my entire life to think about these things and just give you something to go off of so without further ado let's get right into it to the first question can you break down the key principles used when clearing a room or a building if you have suspicions that it might be occupied by enemy fighters. Okay. I don't know who's asking this question or what the context is, but that you guys, again, have heard me say that, write it down somewhere. What's the context of the scenarios? If you're talking about enemy fighters, well, now we're we're talking about uh, a deliberate and intentional and overt kind of assault on something. That's kind of how I take that. So it's a tactical scenario. And realistically, if I'm talking to anybody else, from a standpoint that has no military training or no background in tactics, you have to think about this, right? If I have something that's occupied or a building or a structure or a gas station or my house even, say if I come back up to the house and it potentially has threats in it, that principle of how I approach that home defense scenario is really not much different than I would look at a target overseas to go hit a mud hut with a bunch of bad guys and high value targets in it. So I wanna be able to paint that picture for you guys. What I always ask everybody, if I, if I wanna think about how to approach that or what my strategy would be, I have to ask the first question, is my family safe or not? Is my family integrated into that structure with enemy fighters, with enemies or threats, or are they okay? And if they're okay, if my primary mission is already done, which is to take care of my family, well then I'm gonna be a lot more deliberate and a lot more intentional about how I approach somewhere that could have bad guys in it. Then the next question is, well, what's the purpose of going in there in the first place? If I have a scenario where we're out in town, you know, the end of the world's going on, people are stealing gas from each other, they're robbing people's cars, they're taken from you, they're, they're holding people up, they're shaking people down, And then all of a sudden I get split up with my family and I'm staring at a gas station that we were just at and I was just at my vehicle, I turn around and we end up in a scenario, right? I'm trying to at least paint a rough picture of what could be going on. My family's not safe at that point. Now my primary mission is to get in there and do everything I can to mitigate a threat to them, to mitigate uh, mitigate their their scenario where it would unfold, where they would get hurt. So I wanna be able to get in there with speed, and violence. As opposed to them still being in the car and I look back and I'm like, oh, everybody's safe, everything's fine. Well, now why do I need to go into the gas station with bad guys in it? What's the reason that I'm going in there? And even that should change the dynamic of how I approach the building. Um, Say, for instance, that we left something in there and now I have to go back in and get it. Is it worth my life? Is it worth, you know, that extra risk or that extra threat? So there's, there's a lot to break down here. And I know Maybe I'm not being super clear, but I'm at least trying to give you some baseline ideas of how to start thinking about going into a place that already has bad guys in it, is what's the why? Is my family safe? If they are, why go in there? 
if it's a deliberate attack on something or I have to get through that to get to somewhere else, maybe it's to get out of there and get to safety. Maybe I have a structure that's impeding my movement. And again, this is important for me to create this context for you guys. I'm with my family. We're not in a good place. Nightfall's coming. I want to get back to our vehicle, but there's a structure in the middle between us and our vehicle, a route of escape, that there's bad guys in it. Well, now I'm going to keep my family as protected and behind me as possible, and I am going to deliberately walk through each space as smooth and methodical as I can. And now again, this is where we're going to go to specific training, specific clearance methods. And this enters a whole nother tactical conversation that frankly, I'm not going to have here, but that's where you need to go get training. You need to go understand how you're going to respond with your firearm, your athletic capability, your intelligence, and your tactical capabilities on site. It's all going to be relative to what you need to do, but I hope that at least paints a picture on what I'm going to do. If my family's good to go, I might not even bother. If they aren't, well then they're going to get speed and violence from me until every threat is mitigated and I have my family secure, safe, and sound. Thank you Mountain Tough for sponsoring this episode. If you guys are looking to get in elite shape and great physical condition and boost your overall fitness, you can do it with the Mountain Tough Digital Training Programs. And right now, it's free for 14 days. You can train anywhere you travel with minimal equipment, whether it's in the gym, outdoors, or even at your house. Their app offers expert, progressive plans to build strength, endurance, and resiliency to prevent injury and burnout. They have follow-along coaching videos that will keep you fired up and motivated at every level. Designed for mountain athletes, hunters, tactical professionals, and outdoor adventurers everywhere. Mountain Tough is led by elite athletes and military veterans. You can start your free trial today and use the code DANGEROUS at checkout for 40% off your annual subscription. These guys are locked on when it comes to elite physical fitness, and it starts from the ground up. Go check them out. All right, next question. Are there ways to tell if someone is carrying a concealed weapon? What do you look for when trying to determine if someone is a potential threat? Okay, so printing or even just the demeanor of somebody is something that, it's something that takes training. You have to look for it. You have to want to know that it's there. You have to see these subtle details. It's not hard for me to tell if somebody else is carrying by the way their posture is, by the clothing they have on, if they're printing. So these are things that you can go get reps on and go get training in. You know, if you're looking for somebody that's carrying something, the easiest thing to do is see if there's something protruding on their waistband. If it looks odd and out of place, typically it is. Now, I think the odd cultural thing for everybody to get over in this scenario to tell if somebody's carrying is the straight up fact that you have to stare at somebody, right? You actually have to look at somebody and be like, Huh, are they carrying? And can you do that in an inconspicuous manner? A manner. Can you do that in a way that doesn't make you look out of place or that you're actually staring at them? Because clearly, if you think that they're a threat or something's going on and you want to be able to identify that. I've gotten to the point now where even just quick brushings with people at, at a 7-Eleven, I can tell or look or identify, you know, what's their demeanor? <clears throat> Somebody that is carrying intentionally they're aware that they're carrying, they're doing it as a good citizen. Maybe they have a little bit of training, but typically those people are, tend to be conscious of the fact that they're training and they move a little bit more deliberately and slowly. I can, I can pick up on that sometimes. As opposed to the person that is getting ready to do something bad, and maybe they're carrying and they're getting ready to, you know, they're a lot more fidgety or concerned or nervous. They have that nervous energy about them that is clear as day. You know, and if you've been in multiple threats over and over again, you start picking up on those cues, those precursors, those pre-fight indicators. And that's really where a lot of the pre-fight principles come into play. But I would encourage everybody that's even thinking about this question or what to do, how to set yourself up for success <clears throat> when you figure out uh, or to figure out if somebody's caring is to get the reps in to try, to look, look at people's waistband, you know, look at their demeanor, get into different positions, you know, is what's sticking out on his waistband really uh, a blade or a gun that you think it is? I mean, some people carry overtly, right, which is clear as day, like, oh, that guy's clearly 
carrying on his on his waistband. But how to tell if somebody's carrying when they're concealed is a little bit more difficult, but it does take repetition. It does take a level of awareness and training to know what you're looking for. I think one way to do this is to get with a buddy, get with a partner, get with a training partner, and really work some scenarios. This is why training in those realistic scenarios is so important because I could walk in here into a bar setting or a bank setting or a 7-Eleven setting and really be carrying nothing, walk in, and be like, hey, you know, do you have the time and can I buy a soda? Thank you very much, see you later. And walk out and be like, oh, that was weird, but I didn't see you carrying anything. As opposed to me walking in there with a bigger gun or a blade in my waistband, you have to be able to get repetition in to be able to identify these things and pay attention ahead of time. Again, pre-fight indicators. Look for them ahead of time. The more predictive thinking that you put into this, the quicker you're gonna be able to pick up on something if they're gonna be a threat. I mean, that's what I look for. It's really about behavior. It's about their position. If your hair stands up in the back of the neck and tells you that something just doesn't feel right about the situation, then you're probably right. And the biggest confirmation a lot of the times is something actually unfolding and happening. Either you're getting punched in the face or somebody's pulling out a gun, you're like, oh, I was right. So listen to your instinct ahead of time and get ahead of that power curve. All right, next question. If you think someone that is carrying a gun could become a threat, what are the things you're thinking about beforehand? Okay, so this kind of is a similar play off of what we just talked about. If I'm looking at those pre-fight indicators and I'm like, you know what? My hair st is standing up on the back of my neck and I don't know about this guy. Something feels off or his gun is showing and, and this guy just looks shady. Well, what am I gonna do to set myself up for success? First of all, distance is your friend. If it's a firearm, bullets travel far, distance and cover are your friend. If I think somebody truly is a threat and maybe I'm carrying or maybe I'm not, I'm gonna start looking at my environment. I'm gonna start creating space and still keep as much awareness as possible. Example, again, if we're at a gas station, I'm walking in to pay for my gas or go pick up a bottle of water, and I'm walking in there and I see, and I see something that's off, I might walk into the store and be like, you know what, my family's in the car, I'm gonna walk, turn right back around, get right back with them and make sure I'm in a secure position. Or if I'm by myself, I don't catch it soon enough. I might start getting into the other aisles and be like, okay, where can I get where I've got a little bit of cover, but I have a level of awareness. You know, now I'm looking at the chips to be like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna watch this guy and keep an eye on him. I'm not gonna be shady and draw attention to myself, but I am gonna put myself in a position that has as much awareness as possible. And that's the key thing here, is like, I want to gain as much awareness and be in the best position to either receive getting shot at or to be able to shoot at somebody with a clear view, with a clear line of sight and quick cover. Uh, those are the three things that I would really be thinking about. And, and I do it out of habit at this point. You know, if somebody walks in, I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna move my family over here. I'm gonna guide them this way. I'm gonna move this way. I'm gonna put myself in the middle to be that obstacle. I'm gonna get a good clear vision. You know, what's my excuse for being over here? Oh, I have, uh, you know, cheese snacks that I can look at. Let me just look at the cheese snacks, you know, while this guy's, you know, doing his thing at the counter. And then I move over, I shift over to where the chicken wings are. And these are all just excuses for me to be there. I have a purpose. I'm not just standing in the middle of the aisle, just staring at the guy like, you know, what's he doing? Because I don't want to draw attention to myself. These are a couple of the things that you guys can apply, but like everything I talk about, you've got to rep it out. So the next time you're in 7-Eleven or you're out and about, even today on your way home, think about that. If you have to stop somewhere, how can you get reps in? Even if you don't feel somebody being shady, how can you put yourself in those positions and get a good rep in without anybody really knowing that you did it? That That's critical training that I think can help save your guys' life. Order now, the two women who were killed and found dismembered in Juarez on Sunday were from El Paso. On the southern border, there is a legal concept known as reasonable fear, a lifeline for those fleeing violence. A Texas couple was found tortured and murdered. Police say so far this month, 11 women have been killed in Juarez. And then their bodies or body parts offered up to Santa Muerte as an offering to represent death. In this special Borderland docuseries, I take a deep dive onto true crime stories. Join me as we uncover the truth about the fear behind the crisis. This was a group of powerful people. Never been seen before in Mexico. Evidence of ritualistic elements. We ended up rescuing almost 200 kids. The discovery of multiple women in mass graves. They're almost in every state. 
When you put it together, you have an economic extortion map. But even more violent. Officials are warning of a widespread cybersecurity attack. Frustrations and delays have continued as countless are still without power. Market volatility is at its highest since the pandemic. There are a number of reports across the state. Unidentified crash. All right, next question. Do you recommend carrying a firearm in the car or mounted on your body? So basically, either carrying your firearm on you or mounted in a car is kind of what I'm, what I'm getting that. And I would say context as well. If you're traveling for long periods of time, you have a system down where you off body carry, this is a scenario I talk about in my training often, is that if I'm going state to state or I've got a multiple day trip where you know you're gonna be sitting in the car all day long, that might be a good place to have an off body carry solution where, hey, we're at a gas station, family's gotta to get together, hey everybody, you know I always preempt everybody before we even get to the gas station, five minutes, get your shoes on, get ready, be prepared, put your stuff away that you're working on, and then we're ready to get out of the car. And at that point, I've got my off body solution already you know, either in between my legs or next to me. That way we do our scans and we get ready to get out of the car and I can throw that on my body with a quick draw my guns up online if I need it. But again, I'm not sitting there. It's not mounted in the, in the car anywhere and it's not on me either. So that's kind of an in-between solution. But if you have context where you're working in and out of a vehicle often, Nothing is ever going to replace having the gun on you, the firearm on you or your blade on you. This is the A-plus answer. Even in the scenario I was talking about where I'm traveling state to state, it might be more comfortable to carry off body, but the A-plus is that I always have complete retention of my firearm and, not, and I couldn't become separated from it. Again, if I get in a car accident, where's that gun that was in my bag? It's across the car now and I got to go reach for it. On my body is the best. If you work in and out of a vehicle often, on your body is still the A-plus answer, but can you justify having a gun mounted securely somewhere in your vehicle? Of course. You're going to have quicker access. You know exactly where the reference point is. Nothing's going to change. But security is obviously an issue too. You know, you want to make sure that it's secure so only you can gain access to it, whether it's locked under a key or whatever the case may be. You see a lot of police officers, you know, they drive around with either on their bike or their vehicle. The, the firearm is mounted in the same place every time. They know exactly what they need to do to get that thing out, and they've got reps doing it. But that doesn't stop them from carrying one on their hip just in case they need to get in and out of the vehicle. And that is the pro and con that you need to consider. You know, if you have to jump out real quick and your gun's mounted in the vehicle, is that a good thing? You know, do you want it to stay there? So something to consider. I was always recommend having something on your body, but if you do have to mount it because you're working out of a vehicle, it's understandable. So a little bit of knowledge there. Hopefully you guys can apply that to your lifestyle. That wraps up the questions. We are going to get into the scenarios. Let's see the first video. Perfect. Home defense looks like apartments. We've got somebody in a hoodie and looks like the gun is, I already saw a magazine there poking out and protruding. Again, what am I looking for? Saw a magazine stick out. And that's obviously just turned into a very close quarter scenario where this guy is trying to get in somewhere. He's got a firearm on his hip. The context is that this guy is being followed and that the, the guy unlocking the door, that's actually his house, at least from what we understand. So he suspects this guy of following him. And, you know, luckily he has his firearm out. Now, I do see it on his hip. Why he has it on his hip right there ready to go, maybe it's because he thinks this guy's following him. He kind of turns around, does a quick check, starts to draw the firearm with the keys in his hand, by the way. And that guy did a sloppy draw, which is why he was able to get the drop on him. You know, this is not uncommon. And this is a perfect example of, hey, if somebody's trying to follow you to your house and, and what do they do? They wait for you to unlock the door. They're shoving you and whatever you have in your hand into your house. Now they shut the door behind you. Nobody can hear you. They have you and everything in your house at their disposal. So 
good scenario to understand why we carry on a daily basis. If somebody does follow us to our home, we have something to fall back on and that's that firearm. What is the other thing that he did here? He did a discreet draw. Now, I don't know if that other guy saw him carrying or not because I can clearly see the magazine and, and even the sight sticking out there. But he did a discreet draw. He used his body to blade. Look, it's all hidden. He can't see that draw happening, which is why the gun is out. And he even uses the wall to shield some of that draw. That's a great discreet draw. Um, and that gave him the upper hand in the scenario, helping him defend himself, because clearly that guy was going to draw a gun and, and no good was going to come out of this. So good on him for being able to draw. And it looks like he got a headshot, which is going to put the guy out right away. And again, it looks like an apartment building. Everyday scenario, right? Everyday location. All right, let's move to the next video. All right, so we've got some level of security here. These guys are looking around, hands behind their back. Okay, I see a gun being played with out there, and he comes in right away. Okay, missed the first shot by pulling the trigger. He ducks down, might have grazed his head, but what were they there for? Is the other guy firing back? So this is clearly a retail setting where these guys are coming in here. I mean, you know right away that these guys are just looking around, but then the guy in the back, you kind of miss that because if your focus is on these guys, look at the guy in the background. He's the one with the firearm sitting in his waistband and exa exactly what we were talking about earlier. What are we looking for? The other guys distract him. The other guy in the background is the one setting up and everybody else is thinking, okay, they talked to this. They knew that that's what they were going to do. The other guy planned on pulling it out and everybody else was going to pull out after him. Now, it looks like the other guy's got a firearm because they're all running for their lives. You know, he is getting caught off guard quite a bit. And that guy in the back had plenty of time. He, discre he discreetly draw it as well. I mean, if you look, he used his buddy to get that gun out. It would have been really hard for him to see that draw in this instant. But... Daily flow there. I don't know what they were after. They were clearly there for something. Maybe it was cash. But this is where having a firearm probably saved this guy's life. You know, because it looks like there's three different firearms out with those guys. One, at least two. The first, the guy comes in the back, lifts his shirt up, uses his buddy as dead space, draws, pulls the gun out. It's hard to tell. Yeah, that other guy has a gun in his hand already, but he's, he's covering up. Now, that's where we can break down that guy's level of training, right? If he had a firearm on him already and he sees the gun, this is where the point of no return happens. This is a fight for your life. This guy is now being shot at by multiple people, multiple attackers. It's like his gun's on his hip. They're trying to get the drop on him. But if he would have moved offline and got his gun out, I mean, that... That's the last chance, right? You already got a gun in your face. So as soon as you see this, boom. I probably would have been drawing and taking shots at that point. And the other thing, I'm, I'm learning all this as I'm, as I'm reviewing this with you guys. The other aspect of where he came from, because he used his buddy for dead space to draw that gun, he had to step to the left which is why if I was behind the counter and I had my gun on my hip, as soon as I saw that gun come up, I would have stepped to my left to create further space. It would have been a lot harder for him to get around his buddy, taking shots. And then if you have a high level of awareness, even in the moment where you're taking shots, you get a stable shooting platform. Now, you're, now you've got a field of view of everybody else instead of ducking behind the counter because that's where he really lost his advantage. He's got his hand over his head, you know, praying for dear life that, you know, a bullet doesn't come in and hit him because everybody else is, is breaking contact at that point, but he had no awareness. And you lose that level of awareness if you don't dominate the fight right away. He got on his heels, he got ambushed, and he stayed there, in my opinion, for too long, because any one of those guys shooting across the alleyway there might have hit him behind the counter. Um, a lot to learn from this, but being heads up and really looking around and using your level of awareness, and right here, gun comes up, he goes to draw, but then he hesitates. And again, you know, being boots on the ground and being on the X, I'm never going to tell you what, what you should be doing. But that gun came out and he went to draw and then realized maybe he was a little bit too far behind the power curve. 
which is where that constant movement comes into play and a clean draw comes into play. I step offline, my gun comes out, and I'm taking shots on that guy immediately. Just like we saw that last video, as soon as he was able to get the gun out, boom, he neutralized the threat, the guy dropped. That would be what I was going for here with that guy in the red coat and then immediately shift into who's next. Who else has a firearm? Who else came in here? Who were his buddies? I wish I knew if this guy got hit or not because it would tell a lot about the story. But it also you also see a lot of rounds flying back and forth here. Points from this video, especially from what we talked about, were looking at their demeanor. What are they discussing right now that feels off point? His head's on a swivel, gun comes out, hand goes to his gun, but then he doesn't respond the right way. You know, he half draws, so he doesn't commit. Maybe because he couldn't even get the gun out fast enough at this point. Yeah, see, it changes angles right there. I wish I got to see more of what he had going on. It almost like he looked like he had one of those old school flap holsters that you gotta like hit the fast tech on. You know, he might have realized that his draw wasn't gonna be super clean. You know, he goes to the ground, he loses awareness. So my three points to this are use an extreme level of awareness. You're in a position where you're asking, he already has a firearm on him for a reason. The behavior of these guys should tell you something right away. And in that scenario, keep moving to that left side, get your gun out online, keep your head up for that level of awareness and, and stay on all these guys, right? That way they're all on their heels moving back. But not only that, you're hitting them with effective fire, which could change the dynamic. If these guys decided not to back up, you know, they could have just known that he had the fire on him, which could have caused them to flinch. But there's a lot that could be caused by getting your gun out, extreme level of repetition, and then having the confidence that you're gonna have good shot placement. Man, there's a lot going on in this video. It's a good one. All right, that wraps up these videos, guys. Um, you know, again, that's why we train. That's why we talk about this stuff on a daily basis, is to set ourselves up for success. We have to have the ability to see this stuff before it unfolds. The pre-fight indicators that we're looking for with those guys coming in, that guy following you to your apartment, somebody following you in 7-Eleven, somebody getting ready to rob a place. What are we seeing from this? There's a lot of body language and sound and precursors that we can't hear in these videos that these guys had the ability to see. That's why you have to trust your instinct on your ex when it comes time to do it. And hopefully you've had the level of training. And if you haven't, you gotta get to it. God bless you guys. Thanks for watching Dangerous Questions Ironclad Original, and we'll see you on the next one. Peace.